Well, I just want to welcome all our members, supporters, board of directors, and staff, and I'm really glad that you could all join us. I'm Joyce Leith. I'm Interim Executive Director of Connecticut Audubon Society. Welcome to the 18th Annual Connecticut State of the Birds Report launch. It's always inspiring to see so many people join us to hear more about these important issues. Since 2006, the Connecticut Audubon Society has published Connecticut State of the Birds to increase awareness of the state's conservation needs and to help set the conservation agenda. Over the years, its authors have included some of the top bird and conservation experts in the country, and we're thrilled to have some of them joining us today. This year's report is titled Five Key Issues. New knowledge and better technologies are changing conservation. Over the next hour, you'll hear from Mylan Bull, Connecticut Audubon Senior Director of Science and Conservation, and from the report's authors. Let me start with a few sincere thank yous. We are proud to partner with WSHU FM Radio, sponsor of this year's Connecticut State of the Birds Report. A particular thank you to Charles N. Watson, who for years has generously volunteered his time and expertise as the report's copy editor. And to you, our members, support from members is essential. You understand that conserving Connecticut's birds, other wildlife and their habitats takes a concerted effort. The State of the Bird Report, it, with its analyses, goals and recommendations is a resource that provides additional information that you need to help us with it, this important conservation work. So thank you for joining us this morning and thank you for being a member. We'll now hear from Miley Bull and from the authors. Viveka Morris, clinical lecturer and research scholar in law at Yale Law School and a leader of the Yale Bird Friendly Building Initiative. Dr. Danica Dorowski, Connecticut State Urban Forester with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Dr. Robert Askins, the Catherine Blunt Professor Emeritus of Biology at Connecticut College. Dr. David Forrester, oh, Foster, Director Emeritus of Harvard Forest at Harvard University and co-coordinator of the Wildlands, Woodlands, Farmlands and Communities Initiative. And last but not least, our own Tom Anderson, Connecticut Audubon's Communication Director, Editor of Connecticut State of the Birds and one of this year's authors. Miley will be introducing each presentation and will conclude with a review of the report's recommendations. Miley? Okay, thank you, Joyce, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I think we have a really great uh, State of the Birds report. And by the way, this is our 18th annual State of the Birds report. So we've been doing this for a while. This is a particularly good one. Um, as we know, <clears throat> nature is forever changing. And therefore, we have to change our conservation strategies as nature changes as well. So this report sheds light on five key conservation areas that will be covered, that were covered in previous reports, in which we thought were worthy of updating, particularly in the context of climate change and of the large drop in the population of North American birds over the last 50 years, which has been in the billions with a B, as you know. So we'll start with the problem of birds colliding with buildings, which is one of the biggest causes of bird deaths in North America and probably elsewhere. Then we'll drill down for a look at urban forests in Connecticut, particularly New Haven, and we'll take a broader view of forests throughout the state in New England. Uh, this is a large, a large uh, issue. We'll hear about how recreational trails on nature sanctuaries might be influencing local bird populations. I thought that was a very interesting article. And we'll get an update on the Connecticut Bird Atlas. And then we'll close with a look at the report's uh, recommendations. Okay, so let's start. Um, in 2007, Connecticut State of the Birds included an article entitled Windows, an Unintended Fatal Hazard for Birds. It basically explained the depth and breadth of the problem in detail and reported that at that time, only Toronto, Philadelphia, 
Chicago, and New York had programs to try to solve it. There wasn't much that could be done. Conventional glass was killing many hundreds of millions of birds a year, and bird safe alternatives at that time hadn't been uh, made. Uh, but a lot has changed since then. A great deal of research and tremendous progress has been made, including in New Haven. The first article in this year's report, Making Connecticut Buildings Safer for Birds, written by Viveka Morris. Viveka is a clinical lecturer and research scholar in law at the Yale Law School and the executive director of the Yale Law School's Law, Ethics, and Animals program, which, by the way, she co-founded. She's also a leader in Yale bird-friendly building initiatives. So welcome, Viveka, and thank you so much for providing your article and, uh, and joining us this morning. So thanks. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Connecticut Audubon is such an important organization, and I'm really um, honored and thrilled to be part of this year's State of the Birds report. Um, so as was sort of referenced already, scientists estimate that every year in the United States, up to 1 billion birds die by colliding with buildings. And recent studies indicate that even that staggering figure may be a dramatic undercount. And so of all the direct anthropogenic threats to birds, buildings now rank second only to our outdoor cats. And much of this staggering loss uh, is um, among birds that many Connecticut residents love and know well, including warblers, sparrows, finches, and thrushes. So in, in my article in this year's Bird Atlas, I describe what we know about this phenomenon to date and how it's impacting birds in Connecticut and um, what the state um, and localities here can do to better protect them. And um, you know, as was referenced, bird deaths from building collisions are preventable. Over the past 50 years, there's been an ever-growing body of scientific research that's investigated the causes of these collisions, tested the effectiveness of solutions for collisions, um, and developed a wide range of commercially available materials and strategies um, for both new and existing buildings to make them safer for birds. And so examples of these include glass treated with ceramic coatings that make it visible to birds, insect screens, traditional insect screens, patterned window films, glass with UV patterns, and, and many more. Um, but to actually protect birds from these deaths, having these solutions is obviously not enough. We need these design and lighting strategies to be adopted widely at both new and existing buildings. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. To help protect birds from building collisions in Connecticut in partnership with colleagues, I lead an initiative called the Yale Bird Friendly Building Initiative, which we started a few years ago. And the aim of it is to try to accelerate and study um, the adoption of bird friendly building design on Yale's roughly 350 building campus. So since about 2018, um, Dr. Christoph Zuzkowski and I, the Ornithology Collections Manager at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, have gathered data on more than 2,000 bird collisions that have occurred on or near Yale's campus through monitoring surveys, citizen science observations, partnerships with custodians, um, and more. And so this map here shows some of these collisions um, across a, a, a map of downtown New Haven. Um, covering much of Yale's campus. And so as you can see on this map, what, what's become clear from this um, data is that collisions are occurring widely as, as we know they are in other cities around the country, but that some buildings are far more problematic than others. Um, and the, the article in this year's Bird Atlas goes into these findings in more depth. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so in 2022-2023, um, for example, with the help of dozens of Yale student research assistants, we conducted for the first time um, in Connecticut, to our knowledge at least, systematic carcass survey monitoring of more than 50 buildings. Um, and we recorded during an eight-week period in the fall migration more than 700 collisions. Um, more than 90% of these collisions were fatal, and the birds killed were predominantly migratory songbirds um, representing over 70 species, the most common being dark-eyed juncos, white-throated sparrows, black-capped chickadees, morning doves, and common yellow throats. Um, some of these species killed by these uh, collisions in, in New Haven and Connecticut um, are species of conservation concern, including dozens of northern perulas, um, two Bicknell's thrushes, um, and, and uh, all in all, so far we've added, uh, I think, more than 700 birds to the Yale Peabody Museum's research collection. Um, so it's become clear from this data that New Haven and Connecticut more broadly 
absolutely have a bird window collision problem still today. Um, so we're now using these data in New Haven to try to identify and target specific buildings, the most egregious buildings, to advocate for retrofits and to make the case for updated institutional design requirements for all new buildings. And I'm happy to report this, this has been quite successful so far in the past year. We've seen multiple problematic facades on Yale's campus receive bird safe treatments. Um, these include uh, buildings in both New Haven and in West Haven. And then multiple new buildings be constructed with bird safe design integrated into the glass in permanent ways from the start. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, but you know, while universities and institutions and large campuses can be uh, very important and play an influential role in addressing um, and addressing their own buildings and preventing these collisions. We need broader action than that to address the problem given its scale. So our initiative has also taken on um, some public policy research um, and we produced a report this past August entitled Building Safer Cities for Birds that reviewed all of the laws in, in cities and states related to bird safe buildings and then analyzed sort of their effectiveness and made recommendations based on what more than 20 cities have done to date um, with the hope that you know th this model will be replicated and improved upon by other cities, including um, cities in Connecticut or the state of Connecticut itself in the future. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the co-authors. I'm really looking forward to hearing their work and, and thank you so much for the continued attention to Window Collisions by C.T. Audubon. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. Um, Next, we're going to turn to uh, Danica Dorosky. The 2008 Connecticut State of the Birds report delved into the importance of urban areas for birds and examining important bird sanctuaries, not only in Fairfield, but Westport, Stanford, and New Haven. Uh, meanwhile, Danica Dorosky was leading a team of researchers from the Yale School of Environment in an in-depth study of parks, land trust properties, and forested uh, lots, vacant lots in New Haven. The findings show that even small city properties can be critically important. The study was the basis of Danica's PhD thesis at Yale. She's now Connecticut State Urban Forester with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Danica has been working in urban forestry and related fields for the past 10 years as a horticulturalist at the Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania volunteer coordinator for the New York Restoration Project in New York City, outreach coordinator for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and most recently as state urban forester with Department of, of Connecticut Departments of Energy and Environmental Protection. She holds a BA from Bates College in Maine, an MFS from the Yale School of Environment, and a PhD from the Yale School of the Environment. Danica's article is entitled unfailing the complexities and importance of Connecticut urban forests. And Danica, we are so happy that you're here and have written a great article and uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, sorry, I was taking a minute to get unmuted, but um. I also wanted to add with the bio, I'm, I'm also joined and so happy to be on um, a co-author with um, David Foster and Brian Hall, who were two mentors for me very early on. I did a NSF research experience for undergraduates when I was at Bates College on the Wildland and Woodland Project. So i um, so honored to be, uh, you know, a co-author with um, uh, Brian and David. Um, so my article was really fun to write. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a birder. Um, and so Tom really helped coach me through incorporating some of the birding aspects into um, what, what I was presenting on. This article touched on uh, both my current role as the state urban forester and my prior role doing uh, research um, at the Yale School of the Environment. So um, the first part of the article really is just exploring urban forestry in Connecticut. And Connecticut is such an interesting place from an urban forestry perspective because we're so densely populated and we're so forested. Um, we're the fourth most densely um, populated state um, in, in the country. And uh, we're also one of the most forested and we actually have the highest urban forest cover in the whole nation. So um, I would argue that, you know, in most of Connecticut, our forests are kind of urban suburban forests. You have to go pretty far to find really big rural tracks in our state. Um, and so 
uh, you know, we're a cool state in that we have a lot of forest cover, but we also know we have a lot of inequities in that tree canopy cover. So there was a study by researchers at the Nature Conservancy that looked nationally at tree canopy inequities in different um, census blocks and found that five of the 10 worst disparities in tree canopy cover and in income are here in Connecticut. So we have a lot of work to do to try and um, rectify these inequities. And uh, one thing I talked about in the article was the recently passed um, Act 23206, um, which calls for a 5% increase in urban tree cover um, in our environmental justice communities by 2040. Um, and the, the rest of the article really goes on to kind of talk about a case study of how we might get to that 5% increase and talks about uh, a sort of unexpected type of urban tree canopy cover. And those are what I call forested natural areas. So as the, the state urban forester, often I think there's an assumption that urban forestry is all about planting trees. And certainly we plant a lot of trees in my program or work with groups to plant trees. Um, but an, an equally, if not more important piece of our canopy cover are naturally regenerating forests. So these are forests in cities that look and feel a lot like a forest in a more rural area. They're forests that have stand dynamics where we see uh, trees die and be left there and natural regeneration kind of coming up in the understory. Um, and they're an often overlooked component of our overall urban tree canopy cover. So the second part of the article really zeroed in on research I did as part of my dissertation work, um, looking at these forested natural areas in the city of New Haven. So you can see here, the polygons are showing you the different neighborhoods of New Haven. Um, all of the green areas are either state parks, city parks, uh, preserves, um, or uh, forested vacant lots that were part of this um, study design. And so we really went into these um, forested areas. We sampled all of the uh, vegetation, overstory trees, uh, saplings, and then looking a lot at uh, the regeneration that was coming up. And I think one of the reasons that um, my article, uh, this, this was an article that was published in um, Plus One. And I think one of the reasons maybe it caught Tom's attention for this, um, publication for the state of the birds is because one of the more interesting findings was um, these forested vacant lots that we sampled. These are really small parcels, like a half an acre uh, in the middle of, you know, a very urbanized neighborhood had some really cool forest dynamics that really hint at a potentially valuable wildlife role that these parcels might be playing. Um, so we found that in a lot of these forested vacant lots, um, we're seeing an overstory that includes a lot of invasive species, a lot of Norway maple. Norway maple, if you didn't know, I think, um, at, you know, one of the most um, common street trees is Norway maple. It's planted prolifically throughout the city. And when you look at um, this map, you can see that if you're a, a small forest patch in the middle of a really um, densely populated, densely developed city, your seed source might be coming primarily from street trees. Um, but what was interesting is that once we got into um, the uh, once we once we got into these um, plots and started doing some sampling, what we were finding is actually a lot of bird and mammal dispersed species in the understory. So things like hackberry, black cherry, um, even a lot of hickory. And that to me was really interesting because it firstly demonstrates that clearly these really small parcels are um, valuable from a wildlife perspective. Uh, it also highlights some interesting dynamics in terms of vacant lots having less pressure from things like deer browse um, because deer are not gonna be walking across you know, a really uh, densely developed area um, to uh, browse on a lot of our regeneration. And it also, to me, was really interesting in that I think it highlights um, that, you know, we could be managing and thinking about these vacant um, vacant lots in a different way. I think we tend to overlook these spaces as sort of wastelands, um, and certainly they can be really um, have a lot of negative perceptions in neighborhoods, but there's some really interesting stand dynamics that are happening there. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I think the last photo is um, just a, a snapshot of my... Um, I'll wait till we get to the next. Yeah. And, and this is just a snapshot um, of a, a bald eagle in my neighborhood park. I live in New Haven. I've lived here for many years now. Um, and for me, one of the pieces that I've always loved the most about um, urban forestry is just uh, what an, an incredible impact it has um, on urban communities to be able to see and witness things like a bald eagle, um, you know, in, in their neighborhood park. 
Um, and so I think, you know, zooming back out now to the state level and thinking about my role as Connecticut State Urban Forester, uh, it feels really important to be thinking about um, these spaces as we work towards that goal um, of that 5% increase in urban tree canopy cover. Um, and from a birding perspective, Tom added some great data from eBird that really demonstrated um, that a lot of these um, uh, forested areas, these vacant lots are being overlooked by the birding community. Um, and incidentally, about the same time I was writing this article, uh, some of you may have seen a, a really fantastic article that came out in the New York Times um, from a PhD student at Yale, uh, Diego Soto, who actually looked even more in depth at some of this e-birding data um, to find really um, some unequal sampling in uh, higher income neighborhoods and communities as compared to um, lower income communities. Um, so some really interesting things to think about as, as we work forward towards our goals of having resilient and equitably distributed forests in Connecticut. Uh, thanks, Danica. You know, it'd be interesting to see how um, how important these urban forests are for migratory birds. We need to uh, to take a closer look at and see uh, how, how impactful these uh, these urban forests are. Um, what are the density and 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 numbers of migratory birds that are using these these urban forests? I think um, that would be a, an interesting. Uh, study to look at. I agree. And I think that um, most of my data is sort of, um, you know, suggesting what we might see based off of the tree species, but I'm not a birder. That's not my area of expertise. And so sure. I think an added um, component would certainly be interesting to do out and, and do an empirical study of, you know, what's what are we actually seeing in these different spaces and to take out some of that sampling bias that might be happening um, just through the eBird data set alone. Yeah, so so certainly these urban forests are used by migratory birds. It'd be important, I think, interesting to see how important they really are. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was great. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to ask uh, Bob Askins to speak. Um, and we know, of course, that bird sanctuaries are for birds, but the reality is that people enjoy them too. The potential conflict between the two is an underlying theme of the 2014 Connecticut State of the Birds report, which was uh, Connecticut's diverse landscape, managing our habitats for wildlife. The arguments for leaving sections of bird sanctuaries without trails seems to have gotten stronger over the years, sort of making the balance between preservation and recreation even more of a challenge, um, as Bob's article discusses. So Robert A. Askins, PhD, is the Catherine Blunt Professor Emeritus of Biology at Connecticut College, recently retired, I believe. He is nationally recognized for his research on the ecology of migratory birds and the impact fragmentation on bird populations. Also, I might add that Bob has been a, uh, a colleague, a friend, and a mentor of mine for well over 50 years, and I can't thank him for everything he's done for me personally, as well as for Audubon in general. So his article, the fifth for the Connecticut State of the Birds is called Recreational Trails and Bird Conservation. Continuous disturbances might mean fewer birds. So Bob, over to you and thank you very much. Well, good morning. And it's great to see so many people participating in this session. Um, I've always loved hiking trails uh, ever since I got interested in natural history at the age of 10 years. And uh, I particularly like hiking trails that take me deep into natural areas and into places that are, that are not easily accessible otherwise. Uh, trails are very important for conservation. It's a major inducement for people to support and fund uh, protection of natural areas. If they know at some point they'll be able to explore them. It's uh, also important for environmental education. So my uh, my proclivity is to be very much in favor of trails, but in recent years I've become more and more concerned about the proliferation of trails and many land trust properties uh, in southeastern Connecticut. I notice that uh, 
virtually the entire preserve is penetrated by trails. A trail system on a small nature preserve can be so complex that people get lost in the maze of trails. And uh, it seems like uh, the goal is maximum trail building rather than uh, looking at the ideal level of trail uh, construction. And we do have some evidence that trails have negative effects. Uh, they are a conduit for invasive plant species. Uh, they can cause erosion. And they can also uh, have a big impact on biological diversity. One of the, uh, the best known studies was actually done here in Connecticut on land, a water company pro property in New Haven. It was a long-term study of wood turtles uh, from 1974 to 1994. And for the first nine years, the wood per turtle population was quite stable. Both adult and juvenile populations were doing well. Uh, during that period, there were no trails. Uh, the water company land was restricted, but in 1983, it was opened up to hikers. A parking lot was constructed. Uh, a, a trail system was constructed. And over the next nine years, the wood turtle population declined. And finally, in 1994, the study ended because there were no longer any turtles to, to uh to study. Uh, so there was a local extirpation of one of the species of special concern in Connecticut, uh, presumably due, due to trails. So there were no controls on this study, but it looked pretty suspicious. And there are other sources of information, other research projects that indicate both, both spotted turtles and wood turtles are negatively affected by trails. So birds would seem to be less vulnerable. They're not walking around on the ground where people can pick them up normally. You don't go home. You may go home with a wood turtle, but not a wood thrush. Uh, and they're, we perceive them as being up in the trees. But uh, birds like oven bird and worm-eating warbler nest on the ground. Other species nest close to the ground in shrubs. And their eggs and nestlings are very vulnerable uh, to being trampled on or to discovery by dogs that are running off leash. Uh, so there's a real potential there for uh, a direct impact on bird populations. There have been a limited number of study of studies of uh, the effect of trails on birds, and in order to uh, to get a feel for what's known about it, I really had to look at all of North America. And I can, uh, I summarize an article in State of the Birds. I summarize uh, the results of studies from, uh, from river, uh, from streamside forests in Colorado, uh, oak juniper forests or woodlands in the hill country of Texas, uh, high elevation conifer forests in the White Mountains. Uh, and also studies of deciduous forests in Toronto. And in most of the cases, there was a documented uh, negative impact of the trails on bird populations, on some species of birds. Some species like magpies are attracted to trails, but many species uh, show a decline in abundance close to trails and also a decline in nest success. Uh, so that nests close to trails produce very few young compared to uh, compared to nests farther away from trails, uh, 75 or 100 meters away. Uh, the study that's most relevant to Connecticut was a study in the metropolitan area of Toronto in deciduous forests similar to the forests around here with a similar set of birds. And it was a comparison of many natural areas in the metropolitan area uh, that, that had different densities of trails. Some were trail free, some had a very dense uh, uh, number of trails. And what the authors uh, of the study found was, was that the, uh, the density of trails was a good predictor of the abundance of forest birds. Uh, trails that uh, preserves that had a large number of trails had fewer 
forest birds. So what we need to consider, I think, more carefully where we place trails and how many trails we construct can, should construct. Uh, I think the well, clearly more studies are needed, uh, but it's really important to be cautious at this point. We have enough information to recommend caution so that every nature preserve should have some trail-free areas. Uh, the trails should be carefully placed. Uh, I think much more thought has to be taken about the disruptive impact of trails. Uh, there are a few guidelines we can follow, which seem to work pretty well. One is that you should only be, build trails along one side of a stream, not both sides, because uh, that'll reduce the impact on species of organisms that avoid trails, species of animals that avoid trails. So trails are going to continue to be important uh, for conservation, uh, particularly for raising money for open space uh, preservation and for environmental education and for access by naturalists and scientists. Uh, but we need to optimize the placement of trails and the number of trails rather than trying to maximize the number of trails, which seems to be the approach that's been taken in a lot of places recently. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. You know, I, I wonder if if the if the trail systems we have on on most of our open spaces and um, land trusts are having some kind of a measurable impact on uh, on, on declining bird species like uh, wood thrushes and oven birds. Um, uh, that that would be that would be interesting to find out. What, what do you think about that? Uh, wood thrush. I would expect that the ground, the species that nest on or near the ground are the ones that will be most severely affected. Yeah. Uh, but studies from other parts of the country indicate that it's a wider range of species than just the ground nesting birds. So the, the impact may, may be much greater than that. Uh, birds do tend to move away from trails that are heavily used. And one of the things that's becoming clearer is that trails have more and more traffic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was very obvious during the COVID pandemic when it, some of the trails that I used usually go to, it just had a constant stream of dog walkers, mountain bikers, uh, hikers, uh, just uh, constant traffic. And I think that that sort of activity can drive birds away from the trails. Yeah, we found that's true on some of our sanctuaries as well, and the uh, and and that those that number of uh, people on the trails since COVID has not declined. Uh, we 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 have a huge uh, increasing number of people on our trails, uh, both during COVID and now after COVID as well. So, well, I think COVID gave us a picture of the future. Yeah, what's yeah. going to happen to trails in the future? Right. So it would argue for more protected areas, uh, each one with fewer trails, and, and you'd end up with enough trails maybe to accommodate people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We, uh, we certainly appreciate it. Um, now next, uh, in response to the escalating crises of uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and declining human welfare, uh, many nations and United States are are relying on natural solutions that center on land conservation. But what tangible progress has been made in securing nature and achieving these goals? Uh, David Foster will address this question from the perspective of Connecticut and New England. And uh, Dr. Foster is Director Emeritus of the Harvard Forest at Harvard University and co-coordinator of Wildlands, Woodlands, Farmlands, and Communities Initiative. In collaboration with several colleagues, this is David's fourth article for Connecticut State of the Birds. Thank you, David. He worked on this year's article with Brian Hall, a GIS researcher at the Harvard Forest and at Highstead in Reading, Connecticut. So again, thanks. His Their article titled Wildland, Woodlands, 
farmlands and communities, how well are Connecticut and New England supporting natural resource, natural solutions to environmental crises? Thanks, David. Appreciate your continued support and help. Thanks, Miley. It's uh, great to be here and uh, wonderful to continue to interact with the uh, State of the Birds and uh, Connecticut Audubon. Also wonderful to uh, uh, see Danica and, and Bob Askins, two individuals who I've uh, worked with with great pleasure and uh, uh, enjoyment over the over the years. Well, as as you laid out, um, the context for my talk really is um, both a global and a, a regional set of crises that are represented by climate change, by the loss of biodiversity and the habitat that supports them, and by declines in human equity and well-being. So really, this is a kind of comprehensive and very broad context. As suggested, um, we strongly believe and much evidence supports at local to international and global scales that um, the natural infrastructure and food producing infrastructure of the world is absolutely critical to support nature and to support the well-being of, of all people. And so in 2005, we uh, initiated an uh, initiative called Wildlands and Woodlands, which has subsequently expanded in 2010 from the state of Massachusetts to all of New England and broadened in terms of its, of its nomenclature to include wildlands, woodlands, forested landscapes, along with farmlands and communities representing all of the lived places and spaces that um, people occupy. And we've created through this effort a, a vision for the conservation of the New England landscape that really seeks to advance both land protection and strategic development. Um, really is a critical means of supporting the health and well being of both nature and society. The goal and vision for this initiative is that by 2060, we will have protected and secured legally and through a variety of means, um, up to 80% of the New England landscape in a wide range of wildlands, ma actively managed forests, farmlands, and other land cover, as well as well-designed and, and strategically placed um, human dwellings and settlements. This vision seems radical but when we, and it certainly has been treated that way over time, but in 2005, when we advanced um, the, vi the vision for Massachusetts, we suggested that 50% of Massachusetts should be secured in forest cover. And just this year, the governor and executive branch of the state of Massachusetts actually proposed that upwards of 40% of Massachusetts should be securely protected. And there's a new report coming out with guidelines for forests for the state of Massachusetts that actually argues for the identical 50% that we recommended in 2005. So the background for the study that we report on today, which is just a kind of snippet of a dashboard that we are maintaining to evaluate how is New England doing and how are the individual states doing in advancing this conservation vision, both by securing and protecting land and by keeping the land from being developed. So what we present in the, in the article is just two kind of vignettes, if you will, just two glimpses. One is land protection and the other is deforestation. And the, and the graph that is shown here shows the individual states in Massachusetts and represents the amount of land that has been protected in each of these states um, over time to see where we are today. And as you can see, the states vary considerably in the amount of land that is protected, but you can also see that the states vary in the rate at which the land is being protected. 
So unfortunately, Connecticut stands out um, on this particular graph in two ways. One, by the relatively low percent of land which is permanently protected, but also by the shape of the graph, the curve and line here, which shows that the rate of land protection in Connecticut has actually been on a proportional basis much lower than it has been in any of the other New England states. Now, it turns out that New England, the New England states vary considerably in their goals for land protection. And I just mentioned that Massachusetts has as a target 40% at present, perhaps reaching to 50% um, with the launch of this new report. Um, this past year, the state of Vermont just came out with a goal of protecting 50% of that state in terms of its forest cover. Connecticut's goal, as I understand it today, remains that from a green plan, which was um, launched about a decade ago, and that aspires to protect 21% of the state. A recent analysis by a group of students at Yale suggested that um, Connecticut is yet to reach that goal and may not reach it at the current rate for another 25 to 30 years or more. If we go, go then to the next slide, we can see, well, how are we doing in terms of actually keeping our forests as forests? And again, here, the news is mixed across the states. Um, it's actually a decidedly um, less positive story than the active land conservation story because it shows that each of the New England states is losing forest cover. Essentially, that forest is being destroyed and as it's being converted to um, residential and commercial buildings, and also increasingly as it is being impacted by a range of renewable energy construction, primarily um, solar fields, and to a lesser extent, the erection of turbines and, and power lines. Um, here too, Connecticut um, is showing a, a pattern of decline uh, in forest cover. The rate that Connecticut is losing its forests is not as great as some of the other forests. And what's of interest to me is to note how uh, at present, Connecticut is decidedly more forested than the adjoining state of Massachusetts where I live and where most people feel like they're must surely be more forest than there is in Connecticut. So as we look at these data, we as a group that is trying to work with land protection uh, organizations, state agencies, and private landowners, we see two great challenges. One, to increase the rate at which we are protecting both our farmlands and our forests, and two, to put into place better structures, better legislation, better initiatives, better directives coming out of executive branches of government to constrain the way that we are um, advancing development across each of our states. And then if we go to the next slide, I'd just like to highlight that there are a number of initiatives that are ongoing that we are advancing and that many other groups are advancing. Color. I would especially want to draw attention to the Connecticut Land Conservation Council, which is doing a fabulous job in Connecticut in working very closely with land trusts and conservation organizations to advance land conservation, making information available, reaching many landowners, and moving to push Connecticut in a very different direction than it has been trending in recent years in terms of land protection. We, for our particular initiative, have launched a policy program that seeks to kind of share across the region the policies that are working effectively in each of the New England states, such that um, state legislatures and executive branches in each of the states can benefit from the great work that's being done in adjoining states. And then finally, I just say that we are 
maintaining this dashboard and will seek to share it in ways that it can help to inform the work that we're doing and hopefully help to galvanize more respect for nature and for our food producing landscapes and more success in keeping those intact. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Um, uh, I know that uh, land acquisition is still the best way to protect habitat, but also it's an important yet neglected uh, method of carbon reduction. Isn't that true? Well, certainly keeping all of these landscapes intact is critical for um, climate mitigation by storing and sequestering carbon in their landscapes. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so all the good work that we do in terms of thinking how to best manage our lands is undercut by every acre of forest or every acre of farmland that is that is lost and destroyed. So um, yeah, this is critical for habitat. It's critical as we heard from Bob's um, talk and Danica's talk for human enjoyment. And as we all know, it's very critical for habitat for all species. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Great to be okay, here. Okay, so next, um, six years after the 2017 Connecticut State of the Birds Report devoted 37 pages to the Connecticut Bird Atlas, the project is now in its final stages. An enormous amount of work has gone into it. 367 volunteers, 45,000 checklists, 2,300 locations, all staked out by field technicians. Uh, the result will be online soon. What happens after that is still to be determined. So the title of this year's State of the Birds article is The Connecticut Bird Atlas, Will Years of Effort Pay Off in Better Conservation? It's a good question. It was written by Min Wang, Migratory Bird Program Leader for the Connecticut DEEP, and by Tom Anderson. Tom's the editor of the Connecticut State of the Birds, is also Connecticut Audubon's communications director, is a, is, a lifeline, is a lifelong conservationist, and also the author of This Fine Piece of Water, an Environmental History of Long Island Sound, uh, published by Yale University Press. So, take her away, Tom. Thank you, thank you, Miley. The, uh, the, the Connecticut Bird Atlas is a project of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and the University of Connecticut. It relied on hundreds of volunteers and paid staff and was underwritten by a handful of organizations, including the Connecticut Audubon Society. From the start of the project in 2017, the goal has been to generate data and analysis to guide conservation. Bird populations have been falling steadily in North America for 50 years. Funding for the conservation of non-game birds has long been inadequate. And so another primary goal of the Atlas Project is to galvanize the conservation community to help develop the consistent funding needed to carry out the conservation actions the Atlas will describe. The results will be an atlas on the web where the data and explanations of what, of what the data show are presented for each species and of course available to anyone. The atlas aims to assess whether, how, and why bird populations have changed since the 1994 Atlas of Breeding Birds in Connecticut. Field work for that project was conducted in the 1980s, so an update was overdue. Some of the apparent changes in bird populations are reason, reasonably simple to explain. Ruffed grouse, for example, have lost much of their preferred habitat, namely dense stands of young forests. Uh, the habitat that remains is patchy and scattered across the landscape, making it difficult for the few grouse that are left to colonize it. And what you see on the screen um, before you is the, di the different atlas maps for ruffed grouse from the mid 1980s compared to 2018 to 2021. The black dots are uh, areas where ruffed grouse was confirmed to be breeding. The sort of mid-colored, mid the, the shaded dots are, are places where 
ruffed grouse were probably breeding and this, the open circles are places where ruffed grouse were possibly breeding. And you can see it's all over the northwestern part of the state, but even way down into Fairfield County and on the border of New York and, and up through the Connecticut Valley. The current uh, atlas, however, has found very few locations. Um, <clears throat> The causes of the changes in distribution in, in other species may be more subtle than just outright habitat loss. Habitats may have become degraded or fragmented. Food might be less abundant and harder to find. There might be problems on the wintering grounds. Bird atlases typically divide the areas to be surveyed into blocks of equal size. And you can see those on, on both of these maps. Uh, both Connecticut atlases use the same block grid, 601 blocks, each covering about nine square miles. Breeding bird atlases also typically re rely on observers, most of whom are volunteers, to determine if individual species are possible, probable, or confirmed breeders in each block. The observers work to confirm as many breeding species as they can by finding nests, watching for behaviors such as feeding young birds or carrying food for young birds that occur only near a nest, or looking for birds that are still so young, they must have, have hatched nearby. Trained research technicians complemented the volunteers' data by conducting point surveys by random habitat type, type across the state. They visited 2,302 predetermined locations during the summers of 2018, 19, and 21 to collect data on every bird they saw or heard during a fixed time period. One big difference from the original Atlas of Breeding Birds of Connecticut is that the entire project looks in detail, not just at breeding birds, but also at birds that spend the winter. Unlike with the breeding, unlike with the breeding data, there were no historical data to compare with the winter information the surveyors collected. But even so, some distributional changes were obvious. Common eider and black vulture are both more common in winter than they used to be, for example. Common eider has expanded into the state from the north and black vulture from the south. Presumably these different range changes have different causes. What will the atlas look like? Many of the first bird atlases, including Connecticut's, were published as books. More recently though, atlases have been published online, which is the plan for the current Connecticut bird atlas. It'll have block maps and predictive maps. The hope is still that they will be finished this winter. It will have species accounts with photos, explanatory text, and maps. Most importantly, however, is that Atlas data will be used for planning how to protect and regulate the state's natural resources. Collecting contemporary data to serve as a foundation of conservation was one of the two primary goals of the Atlas. That goal has been achieved. Still to be determined is whether the Atlas can galvanize the conservation community into creating a stable and lasting funding mechanism to protect birds. Realization of the second goal is the true challenge ahead and should be the lasting legacy of the Atlas project. And that's a perfect transition actually for the report's recommendations. Um, and at that, I will turn it back for Miley to handle that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so Tom, yeah. Uh, it looks like the, the digital production of the atlas will be handy in, in the fact that we can modify it as time goes by without printing new copies of uh, of books. Uh, I assume there's going to be at least a few, you know, hard copies of the of the atlas as well. But I think it's um it's it's it, it's a great idea to do this digitally. So as as things change, uh, we can modify the atlas as well. So. Uh, I, I think that's a smart move. Yeah, I think I think that's probably the case. I, I know from my own experience as a New York resident, um, I have on my bookshelf a massive tome, the Breeding Bird Atlas, 1980 New York State Breeding Bird Atlas. And it's now been updated three times and having it online is, obviously it makes updating much easier. It's, it's for these days much easier yeah. to use. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so all this all this leads to what we consider our recommendations uh, to move forward. So obviously, land protection is key. As as uh, as David mentioned, 
you know, Connecticut is way behind in protecting land. Um, you know, the state's goal of protecting 21% of the land by 2023 uh, is sadly lacking, to put it mildly. Um, at this rate, we won't catch up until 2087. So we really need to drill down um, and encourage our state legislatures uh, and the people who are um, heading our conservation efforts in Connecticut to really try to uh, to in increase um, our land acquisition efforts. So that's that's key. Secondly, um, we we need to kill fewer birds in buildings. Uh, something like a billion birds die every year in North America when they fly into buildings. We have to we have to work on that. So we recommend that that uh, Connecticut begin work on bird friendly building policies, um, codes and initiatives as well. New York City is doing that um, with local law 15 of 2020. We need to do that in Connecticut and, and uh, get moving on this. There's too, way too many birds. It's so sad to see, uh, you know, dead birds lying under windows everywhere, especially in, in, in tall buildings. I mean, and we know now that we can address those issues. And it, and next, of course, we need to pass the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, we've been pushing for this for the last few years, uh, since 2018, actually. It's been one of our key recommendations annually since then. Um, it passed the House of Representatives in 2022, but died in the Senate. It has to be uh, revived. This would direct something like $1.4 billion to states each year to carry out our wildlife action plans. And I've been involved in um, updating our Connecticut action plan uh, recently as well. Connecticut alone would receive something like $12.6 million annually from the fund. Can you imagine the impact that this would have on conservation in Connecticut? I mean, we definitely, we've got to get this act passed. Um, I think, as I mentioned to Bob Askins, that uh, we need to study the effect of trails on bird population diversity here in Connecticut. Um, this would be a great project for a PhD student um, to dive into, and we could uh, document, you know, what exactly are the effect of trail the effects of trails on bird populations. And finally, protect urban forests. Uh, we need to document their importance for birds. Um, many of our wooded tracks prove to be important for climate change mitigation. Many are the only green spaces in poor neighborhoods, and data about bird life there could help build a case for preservation and management for many of these locations. So these are some of our uh, important recommendations, and we're going to be pushing hard on these in the upcoming year. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody very much. I'll turn it back to Joyce. Over to you. You're muted, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> Thank you, Miley. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, so I believe Tom will be reading some of the questions. Um, and Tom, are you able to? join us and in... yeah yes let me let me get them there were a number of questions that were actually answered already in the chat but let me um first thing i wanted to ask is is there a number of um journalists on the call including jenny Ahrens from um connecticut public wnpr and jenny asked if she could ask a question but i don't know what it is um jenny if you want to put them in the chat that would be fine and we could we could get to them that way that might be the easiest since everybody is muted um in the meantime um this uh david this might be a good question for you to uh, answer perhaps um a woman named betty men Mancucci says, I'm from Rhode Island. There's a push for more low income houses mandated by the state that is affecting increased development in town. How does increased population fit in with trying to protect more land in the future? Is that something you could talk about a little bit? Sure. 
Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, an excellent question and, and uh, you know, an obvious potential point of, of conflict. Um, the goals that we established um, were, were created with, with two things in mind. One, um, that we will need to actively develop some additional land. And so there actually is a percentage um, uh, that takes that into account. But the most important thing really is that land protection needs to be paralleled very closely by very effective and very strategic land planning. And right now across New England and across much of the United States, we do a very poor job of this. Um, it's not centralized in any fashion. And for example, in New England, it's largely with the exception of, of places like the state of Vermont, which does have a statewide land planning legislation. It's really left up to um, towns to both zone and control development. We can do development much more effectively. We can certainly accommodate a lot more people in our landscape without developing any additional new land, just through the more effective redevelopment and clustering and um, uh, increase in, in density of buildings that we that uh, in areas that are already currently developed. So there is very clearly the potential for, and in most cases, the reality of a conflict between um, development, population growth, and land conservation. But it's something that we can readily resolve um, if we look effectively towards um, uh, more effective planning coordinated with more effective conservation. Good point. Thank you. You know, that was um, Jenny Aaron's, uh, the, the WNPR reporter asked something that was very close to that. So I, I'm hoping that that um, your answer uh, answers her question as well. Um, Vincent Gabrielle, who's a reporter from Connecticut Insider has a question for Danica, um, and I see that Danica has just got, gotten back on. He says, um, can you please elaborate on the relationship between your work and the work of um, Diego Soto, which you referred to uh, during your talk? Um, sure, there is no relationship. I actually didn't know who Diego was until I came across that article uh, in New York Times and saw how closely it aligned with work Tom and I had done using the eBird data set to actually see how many of the areas I had sampled through my dissertation work were um, part of eBird. So um, yeah, there's there's no relationship though. Clearly there's a lot of intersection in the work that we're doing. I would like to say, however, that, uh, not however, I would like to add that I've been in touch with Diego a couple of times over the last couple of weeks. Each winter, we do an online series called Young, Gifted, and Wild About Birds, and he's going to be doing going to be doing one for us probably in early February. So there'll be, uh, we'll have another chance for all of you to join us then and, and hear more about his work, which is really actually interesting. Oh, um, awesome. That's great. Yeah. So um, from Jenny Ahrens, um, how much more expensive is it to make a new building more bird safe? Um, is Viveka still with us? I hope she is because she could she could perhaps answer this. There we go, great. How, so, so Jenny asks, how much more expensive is it to make a new building more bird safe? And how much more does it cost? How much does it cost to retrofit an existing structure and make it more bird friendly? Uh, thanks, Jenny. It, it really depends on what the retrofit is in that there's a, a very wide range of solutions. American Bird Conservancy, um, the nonprofit, has a database online of hundreds of solutions that, that can be implemented. And they range from very expensive, like totally replacing the glass on a building, which can be an enormous cost, um, depending on the structure with, with new glass, to keeping the existing glass and then doing temporary solutions like anything like tempura paint, uh, hanging um, hanging uh, like strings on the outside of the glass to make it visible to birds. And so 
there's a there's a whole range of sort of DIY, very cheap, very affordable solutions um, to to much more expensive ones. And I'd say that you know it's also true that incorporating bird friendly design from the start of a building tends to be much more um, economical than trying to the building a giant glass structure and then trying to address it after the fact where your options both aesthetically and and otherwise are, are much more limited at that point and it tends to be you know of course always an additional cost so I think I think um you know in the cases that we've seen here in New Haven where, where the bird friendly design has been incorporated from the start the the cost has been uh, minimal if not um, negligible thanks for the question there's a question on here about invasive species. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just need to scroll through and find it again. Maybe it might be appropriate for, um, actually, maybe uh, David and Danica. Um, I'm wondering, this is a woman named Cheryl Weston. I'm wondering about the role of invasive species taking over our wooded, our, our, our water our wooded areas, urban forests, and fields, and how it affects birds. Yeah, so why don't uh, Danica mentioned uh, Norway maple as a common species in many of the urban forests. So Danica, why don't you pick up from, from that, and then I may have a few things, but it may be that Bob and some of the other really active birders can then uh, uh, finish the end of the uh, answer by talking specifically about what they know about invasives and bird species. Yeah, thank you. And and I'll just say, like, I, I already put the caveat out there. I'm I'm not a birder, so I actually can't speak um, from my own research experience to the impact of a lot of these invasive species on bird um, bird populations. Though I can certainly speak from a forestry perspective and. One thing that, um, again, was was really valuable and interesting in our research from our plots in New Haven was thinking about um, not only like invasive species as like sort of invasive, non-invasive, but thinking about the spectrum of invasive species. And I think there's maybe a little more nuance to this question because there's a lot of different types of invasive species. And when we're thinking about uh, forest management and how to make sure that we're, you know, maintaining forest resilience and diversity and all of these things that we know are so important when we're thinking about climate change. Um, different uh, types of invasive species can be uh, more challenging to manage. So the example of Norway maple, uh, Norway maple and um, burning bush were two really prolific ones we found in New Haven. And those are really problematic because they're also really shade tolerant. So they're able to really go into forest interiors and really jeopardize a lot of the diversity and regeneration that we see. And that's in contrast to some other, um, you know, uh, sort of di functionally different invasive species, like maybe um, mugwort or a lot of, um, you know, black locust is a good example of a species that's considered invasive here in Connecticut, but that's really shade intolerant. And so functionally has a really different impact on forest structure and resilience when we're thinking about it. So I know that doesn't quite answer the question, but it gets that it's sort of, there's more nuance to the um, question, I think, than <laughs> meets the eye initially. Yeah, I just underscored uh, Danica's ending point that um, it's um, it's actually a much more complicated uh, subject. And I think in terms of actual forest structure and function, um, I think the concern about invasive species is unfortunately overblown. I say unfortunately because I think it diverts um, attention and resources from actually retaining the forests or the the landscapes intact um, themselves. But I think it would be fascinating to hear what, uh, you know, Miley, uh, Bob, Tom, and others might have to say about the effect on bird species. I can speak to, uh, to that in a general way. Uh, there's good evidence that a lot of invasive introduced invasive plants have a much lower density of insects. And that's probably one reason they're invasive. They've left most of their uh, insect specialists back in Japan or China or Europe. And not, uh, so far, not many native uh, insects here have adapted, have shifted over to these introduced species. Uh, 
For birds, that means less food, particularly during the breeding season, which most birds in this region become insectivorous. And this is one reason that uh, uh, when if you're designing a, a garden to attract wildlife, that it's much better to use native species than introduced species. Now, another source of food for birds, particularly during autumn migration, is fruit, uh, berries that are produced by many shrubs and vines uh, during the fall migration. And migrants may often do benefit from these, uh, this new source of fr fruit. Uh, but I think one problem is a, a lack of synchrony between migration time in Japan and where most of our invasives come from, or East Asia, and the period of migration in North America, the, the fall migration in the temperate areas of Japan and Eastern China and Korea is later in the season. And so many of the fruits are not really synchronized for the migration system here. So that's a more subtle effect. Uh, but Insects are also important during fall migration, and uh, again, the in introduced species tend to have fewer insects. So on balance, replacing uh, North American species with Japanese species does not work well for birds. <clears throat> yeah, also, um, you know, if you look at new developments, new uh, suburban developments, they are, are normally dominated by uh, uh, invasive plantings. So, you know, people go to the, uh, you know, they go to their nurseries and they pick out the plants that are almost more than 90% uh, uh, non-native. And that results in, uh, you know, these fairly large areas that are basically, you know, sort of bird deserts because there's no insect coming in to feed on these, uh, these um, uh, non-native species. So, uh, there's a multiple a multiplier effect there. Absolutely. Um, well, we're a little bit past noon, and so we had promised people that we would be ending uh, pretty close to on time. And I really, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of the authors um, for your wonderful research and articles, but for taking the time to share further information with us. We still have a few questions online. There are a lot about Hartford. Please know that we are working very hard in Hartford on urban bird treaty rededication and programs in Hartford. Um, all the information that we're sharing, we are sharing across the state to all of our uh, more urban as well as our rural areas to ensure that we are sharing these best practices. Um, the information and the research that the that the authors shared with us today will really make a significant difference in conservation across Connecticut. I do want to thank all of our members and for everybody who joined us today because your interest in this really does make a difference in how Connecticut it will look in um, 10 or 20 years. And we're hoping we hit those goals and exceed our 21%. We really want to go for that 30 by 2030 uh, national goal. Um, I want to thank our, our sponsor, uh, WSHU FM Radio. And again, as Tom noted, reminding everybody, watch for announcements uh, in January for our Young, Gifted, and Wild About Birds series. Uh, it's a great opportunity to hear from up-and-coming researchers on different conservation issues. But most of all, tomorrow starts Hanukkah, and it's our holiday season. And I want everybody to have a very happy and healthy holiday season. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.